Here this morning is David Slavja. David is a three-year boarding student from Newtown, PA. He is co-president of the Student Life Association, co-chair of the Spiritual Life Committee, and captain of the varsity fencing and speech and debate teams. He is also the proud roommate of Devin Smith. David. I'm tired. I, I really am. No, really, that's what it is. I'm exhausted, drained, and fatigued. I had a hard workout this morning, didn't get enough sleep. I'm tired, you know. <clears throat> I'm actually feeling a bit under the weather as well. That's probably what it is. For the last time, I'm just tired, that's all. I'm lying. To be honest, I've never told a lie as much as that one. That I was tired. It's all too familiar and far too easy. In fact, it's comforting. Like a warm embrace or an escape from the stress of life. It's a smoke screen, a facade, an easy way out of a very tough conversation. And I don't say this, like it's not something y'all don't know. Most people do this. You have a tough day, and when someone asks you how you're doing, be it because of your sunken eyes, defeated gaze, or lackluster walk, you tell them you're tired. August 31st, 2020. My mom and I had spent the whole day rearranging the furniture in my room. A stack of notebooks, a calculator, and a box of mechanical pencils sat on my desk. The shelves behind me carefully decorated as to showcase my vivid personality. It was finally here, the first day of online school. <laughs> I felt ready, excited even. Awake early, I made my bread, brushed my teeth, ate breakfast, and was anticipating a full virtual day. It went great. I was in my room between classes, not confined to the musty hallways and windowless rooms in Council Rock North. After my last class, I spent an hour do, uh, doing homework, freeing up the rest of my afternoon for virtual fencing practice, Minecraft, and flirting over Instagram DM. Even in the face of one of the world's deadliest pandemics, I was having a blast. The next day went the same, and so did the day after that, the day after that, but slowly and surely things changed. I was less excited to press the blue join meeting button, while a week earlier I had done my homework immediately after school, I now did it later and it took longer. It kept going. I would put off my homework longer and longer, staying up late in the night just to give up and use photo math because I didn't really care anyway. After the last Zoom call ended, I was right back in bed. My incessant procrastination eventually turned into pure, life-sucking, unadulterated apathy. The days grew colder and shorter. It was barely November, my camera was seldom on, Day after day, things got worse. My grades crawled ever downward, as did my motivation, energy, and health. I was in the hole. A point where you feel there's simply too much gone wrong, and you cannot get out. A point where you're hopeless, helpless, and too tired to care. The hole keeps getting deeper, and try as you might to dig yourself out, nothing helps. I felt alone. As my mental health continued to decline, I began to see, seek a way out. I spent many nights grappling with my conscience, fighting my desire to end my own life. I wanted nothing more than to take the final step, to finally be free of the suffering and the loneliness. On December 30th, I was in a cramped Airbnb with my family. In the bathroom, I sat on the floor crying. I hated myself, my life, and everything else. I was intent on taking my own life. Looking back, it's really weird. It's weird to think that the last 396 days might just have not happened. All of the joy, laughter, and love that has happened since then and will happen in my future could have been gone. All because at the moment, things were so bad they weren't worth getting better. On my way to the kitchen to get a knife, I saw my mom. She was chopping carrots and asked what I was doing if I needed anything. I, it was, I took a chance and tried to speak. All of the pain and suffering over the last few months, all of the cuts I've made and tears I've shed coalesced in a meek, I'm not okay. When I came to Hill in the fall of 2021, I thought things would be much better, and for a few months they were. The depression and anxiety that had plagued me for the last year had magically disappeared or so I thought. Nearing the end of my first year here, I started to decline again. 
I was chronically fatigued, unmotivated, and depressed beyond belief. Perhaps this was more of an issue than I thought. Many people don't understand depression and see it only for its symptoms. Simply put, depression is like mashed potatoes. Really? Let me explain. Imagine one day you start to lose your sense of taste. Not in a uh, bad covid way, but yeah. At the same time, you never really feel full when you eat. Soon, everything you eat starts to taste like mashed potatoes, and no, not even good ones. Plain, probably from the box, no seasonings, no butter, no gravy, mashed potatoes. So the food you eat becomes tasteless, and you still never feel satisfied. You stop using seasoning or eating your favorite foods because why bother? And putting effort into anything seems fruitless because in the end, it all just tastes like mashed potatoes and you're still hungry. Perhaps someone notices. Your best friend of five years wants to help and they say, well, have you tried eating spices? They have great intentions, sure, but you know that no matter what you do, it's all just mashed potatoes. Now, some days are better than others and things taste awesome, but other days, it's all you can do just to take a bite. Over the past, last four years, I've tried my best not to let my anxiety and depression define me, and I like to think I've succeeded. I've gotten much of the help I needed with the support of the amazing people in my life. I faced my unfounding fear of medication. I went to therapy and still actively work on managing the symptoms of mental illness. Unfortunately, I'm not perfect. Life still feels like mashed potatoes to me sometimes, but I've learned a lot. I've learned that I can have depression and be happy and laugh. I've learned that I can have depression and help others exude positivity or make really bad jokes during lunch announcements. I've learned that I can have anxiety and still talk to people. I've learned that I can make mistakes, raise my hand, have a short-lived career as Hills Premier beatboxer. Sorry, Mrs. Bloom. I've learned that life is really hard sometimes, and I will probably mess things up a lot. But if I can give a chat and talk with arguably one of the worst haircuts I've ever received, then that's enough for me. <laughs> At my lowest, I needed nothing more than some help. So to end this talk, I'd like to arm all of you with the ability to help others. I'm neither a licensed therapist nor an expert, but these three steps can be a starting point for you to be there for those who need you. Step one, understand them, even though you can't and won't. Take a moment to look at things from their perspective. Given humans incredible ability to perceive the world differently depending on who they are, everyone will react to or feel differently about things that happen to them in their lives. Even if you experience something similar or identical to theirs, it's not the same. Open your ears and actively listen. Step two, be there, literally. Take time to sit down and let this person talk to you about what's happening in their life. Make eye contact. Go somewhere private. Let them complain and vent and tell you everything they want about what's happening to them. This won't happen in asylum though. You must strive to make them feel safe and initiate this conversation. Make yourself open to this, as being there for them is the first and most important step. With this, remember to never worry alone. In many cases, you need to talk to someone else you can trust, an adult, teacher, advisor, or friend, about who is struggling and actually get them help. Which brings me to step three. Do something, anything. If their struggles are being exacerbated or made worse by small problems in their life, help them out. My mom would often help clean my room, and as silly as it seemed, it made all the difference for me when the most I could do was drag myself out of bed. If your friend, roommate, sibling, whatever, is struggling to function in their daily life for any number of reasons, then your deliberate actions to help them out can both relieve some of the pressure of mental illness and reinforce that you care. Every person in this room has the ability to save lives. Being afraid of getting someone the help they need will only ever make things worse. In conclusion, we, as a community, need to understand mental illness not for its dictionary definition, but rather for the people that suffer every single day. Living with anxiety and depression has made my life harder and almost ended it. But I refuse to go on without arming others with the ability to prevent suffering. I thought about backing out of this chapel talk, and as Reverend Copper Martins can attest, I wrote a lot of this last night. The idea of exposing the weakest part of myself and the worst part of my life was almost just too much for me. But the hope that one of you, someone, may hear what I have to say and go on to be there for a friend who needs you has kept me going. Understand that.
be there for them, and do something for them, for those who need it the most. And for those of you who are struggling right now, your pain is very real, and I, along with the rest of the Hill community, am here for you. With help and time, things will 